roommate syndrome can be really, really toxic because with these two living as roommates, you can live for roommates for like 10 years. But the moment you have an affair and the discovery happens, that's when change occurs. My name is Laura Heck. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, certified Gottman therapist, and co-host of Marriage Therapy Radio. I'm Zach Brittle. I'm a certified Gottman therapist in private practice in Seattle. I am also the co-host of Marriage Therapy Radio with Laura Heck. Today, we're taking a look at Issa Rae's Insecure on HBO, and specifically her character's relationship to her boyfriend, Lawrence. Issa and Lawrence are in their late 20s, they live together, and they're in a long-term relationship. Issa works at a nonprofit that benefits young children of color. Lawrence is unemployed and feeling lost after his startup company fails to take off. After her 29th birthday, Issa starts to question their relationship. Don't be a dick. Dating is hard. Not if she didn't take it so seriously. Plus, her standards are way too high. Yeah, maybe she's lower than like I did. <laughs> Wait, what the f Never mind, just forget it. So here's what you don't see. Before this scene, she spends this time sort of like cruising, looking at hotties on the internet. So she's already, like what we talk about is like cheating. Cheating occurs in the mind before it actually occurs. And so what we don't see is that she's not grumpy. She's not like, this isn't normal behavior from her. This is her already with like a foot out the door, literally. I mean, um, but she's already been thinking and contemplating, maybe there's something else out there. Maybe the grass is greener on the other side, which is why she doesn't let some of these like comments from her boyfriend Lawrence roll off of her back, why she's a little extra snarky at this point. The show does a great job immediately of setting up who the two of these guys are. I mean, she's obviously dressed to the nines and ready to live her life. And he's, it's evening, right? And he's eating a bowl of cereal in his, in his sweatpants. Like, so they've already set us up to not feel terribly invested about their connection to one another, just like she's not. I don't want to just sit on the couch with you for the rest of my life and, and wait for something to happen. What are you talking about? Nobody's just sitting on the couch. I'm almost done with my business plan. You know, I'm just getting my shit together. You've been getting your shit together for four years, Lauren. This is so not fair that she's dropping this bomb on her way out the door. Like, the only reason why she's saying it now is so that she can relieve her own guilt that she's going to go out there and try and hook up with somebody else. Like, I can see the shock on his face. Like, what? Where is this coming from? Because all of this has been in her head, and she's been thinking about it and probably stacking up the reasons why she's going to betray her partner and why she needs to go out there and look for somebody else. And meanwhile, it's just all coming out for the first time, and he's, he's shocked blown away by all of this. Well, I'm pro Isa here. Like, I think uh, this isn't a surprise, right? She's not like dropping a bomb on him. Clearly, he's been sitting around like this for a, for a while. I mean, she's learned that she can't count on him to get what she wants. So, you know, it's interesting because she uses this phrase that maybe she should settle like I did. They call it settling down for a reason. Nobody wants to settle down. Um, and so let's see if we can. She's trying to raise the bar, I think. And good for her. I'm saying maybe we should Get our shit together separately and see what happens. You want to break up with me? You know, Molly's waiting on me. I'm going to spend the night at her house. and we, we can talk about this tomorrow. Hey, Issa. See you later. Hey. It's like she does like the slow-mo walk out of the room. Like, I just dropped a bomb and I'm out. See you later. Deal with that. We see a lot of this. A lot of people are stonewalling. It appears as though they're little more than roommates. I mean, they're not aligned in value. They're not aligned in schedule. They're not aligned in fashion, you know? I mean, at least in this scene. So, and again, I think what happens to roommates is they settle and they kind of say, you know, I don't, I don't need or want much more than what I have. And she's finding a way to burst that. As a therapist watching them, I might want to encourage her to find a way to burst that by moving toward her partner or inviting him to something deeper. But he doesn't seem ready to accept that invitation. He's clearly cast as kind of clueless and kind of selfish and not all that interested in, in raising the bar for himself. Roommate syndrome is this idea of two people who are in an intimate relationship where the assumption is that you're, you have intimacy, but you end up living more like roommates. You end up living these parallel lives where um, like Isa has a great job and she has this friend and she's getting ready to go out on a Friday night and she's dressed up and meanwhile like her partner, they're not doing these things together. There's really doesn't seem like there's any sort of conversation 
aside from the fact that she walks out and she's dressed to the nines. And there, I mean, that part I found to be kind of interesting that that was the first conversation about what are you doing tonight? Don't you think as a couple, you would have already previously had a discussion about like, well, maybe we could watch a movie or we could do takeout, we could go out or whatever it might be. But clearly there's not a whole lot of intersection or commonality or agreement as to where they're going, which is what she says, like, what are we doing here? There's no real end point. And usually that end point is that intersection for two people, but their lives have just been running parallel to one another. I am so glad. This night is over, and I got us a present. Bam. Who's Daniel? Hmm? In this moment, I feel so much for him. I mean, you can just see he's been sitting there waiting for her to come home, sitting in the dark, telling himself stories about what this relationship with this guy is all about. And I can only imagine that his heart is just pounding out of his chest and he's just been sitting in fight or flight until she opens that door. I mean, every fear that he has, he doesn't want it to be true, but I think that our instinct is so strong and powerful. When you think your partner might be cheating on you or has betrayed you, we want our instincts to be wrong and we'll oftentimes try and talk ourselves out of it. Like we're crazy for having these thoughts. Why don't we trust our partner? But your instincts are often so right. Does she feel relief or does she feel terror? Probably a little bit of both, but this is where the rubber meets the road. Did you f Why would you ask me that? Because I am. Did you f him? Oh, right there, right there. Dropping the eyes, looking down, all of the silence, that's brilliant. Well, and how hard has her brain been working for the last like 30 seconds, 30, 45 seconds, you know? Most people, when they don't want the truth to come out, it's not because they're clean, they don't, they're trying to clean up after themselves, it's because they don't want to hurt their partner. I, I truly believe that the reason why, like in this moment, she could have said, no, no, we just kissed. And thinking that if she says we just kissed, because she's clearly caught, like there's no way out of this, but I don't want to tell him that we had sex because I, I don't want to hurt him. And I, I believe that that is that human beings just generally don't want to hurt one another. And that's why we get the slow drip of truth. Most people who go into situations like this, just like Issa did, they don't, they don't dive in, they wade in. Um, and so they find themselves more slowly and slowly getting caught up in something that they don't, that feels great and that they don't really have a, a total sense of control over. And so when you have to come out of these things, most people don't rapidly get out of the get out of it. They have to yeah. slowly wade out um, mm -hmm. because they don't. They're not equipped, frankly. I thought we were in this, Issa. I'm so fucking stupid, man. I'm stupid. Just tell me what I can do, and I, I will get the fuck out of here. Lord, so please. Get the fuck out no, of here, Issa. Lord. Issa, get the fuck out of the way. No. Issa, what get the fuck out of the way. Just talk to it me. It ain't shit to talk about. This moment right here. That that is where so much situational domestic violence occurs is when one person's blocking the other person from getting out and they don't want their partner to leave. They're worried that their partner, once they leave, like they're going to be on the road. They're worried about them being gone. They want to hash it out. They want something. And so they end up blocking the door and it's the act of getting through the door where often couples who have never been violent toward one another ever have uh, an altercation for the first time. Do you feel like his, uh, response is warranted like i'm pro isa and you're supposed to be because she's the hero of this show but like does she deserve this response this man thought that he could love and trust his partner and it doesn't matter to me if the if the guy is eating cereal and has been jobless and working on his business plan and the relationship has been stale does does that warrant her going outside of the relationship and having sex with another man like mm. i would be angry I'm not Lisa, come on up. He does at least do a bit of de-escalation for himself. He understands what his boundaries are. I'm worried for Issa at that moment, and I'm worried for him that they're going to cross a line that they probably have never crossed in the relationship. And then she stands and blocks his way in front of the door, and I'm thinking, that right there is risky. That is, that is yeah. a situation that yeah. I know that you have heightened 
emotions. You have someone who is clearly emotionally flooded, not thinking clearly, and now you're blocking his exit when he doesn't feel safe. I That to me seems like a pretty um, tough situation. So yeah. it doesn't yeah. happen, but do I think that he has a right to be angry and raise his voice and be really, really flooded 100%? If they were in my office, right, and, and they and this happened in my office, I don't think the first thing I would say is, hey, Lawrence, um, I need you to, uh, you know, temp t tone that down a little bit because it's it, it, like, cause it's just, and I think that's where I think I'm trying to figure out the line between anger and violence. Yeah, it's interesting that you say anger and violence because violence doesn't have to be putting your hands on someone. Yeah. It's hard to say, like, is there any appropriate way to handle when your partner tells you or you discover for the first time that you have been betrayed? Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of different ways that couples handle that. And it's interesting because that scene probably was about 45 seconds long, but for some couples, it could be four and a half hours of four, four and a half talking months. it through. Yeah. And I'm just glad that he got out. Like that was the remove yourself from the situation was the right move. By the way, like 30, what is this statistic? Is it like 30 high 30s percent of all women have affairs on their male partners it's pretty high and and males are in the 40s so um it's not uncommon at all that isa had an affair on her partner sometimes i wonder like oh do i give up too easily on things i don't know i mean it might be obvious, but I did wish you hadn't given up on us. So just to sum up, there's been a big blowout and now they haven't been together. They're dating, but nothing serious. Okay, fair enough. Fair grounds and a great, great question. Which question? The question of what would have happened if we would have stayed together. Yeah, that's actually not what I thought he was going to say because he comes into this with a way different posture than we saw, you know, earlier. And I wondered if it was going to be apologetic. like. I was wondering what would how it would have been different if I had really paid attention to you like or if I had really stepped stepped up to the plate like would that have changed your behavior because it might not have right she might just be sex addict or or some kind of like serial betrayer we don't we don't think so but like it'd be interesting for him to investigate his part of the part of the equation because the first scene that we saw s set us up for the betrayal I mean we knew it was going to happen I'm wondering about his pathway to repair and then she says I wish you hadn't given up on us. And so of course it begs the question of, well, who gave up first? And when was the giving up? Because he might've given up when he settled, right? And just never got out of his pajamas. She might've given up when he, when she, you know, went seeking out this other relationship. He might've given up when he left the, the, uh, the apartment. Why Daniel? He just popped up and gave me attention during a time when you weren't. And it's not an excuse, but it just felt good to feel wanted, I guess. So here's the thing that kind of blows me away is that he seemed surprised that she had all of this going on under the surface. And I think it's her responsibility. Clearly, I must not be like pro Isa in this, but I think it's her responsibility if she's experiencing pain or discomfort or she's feeling neglected in the relationship or she feels like he's not goal oriented and that's bothersome for her. That should have been a conversation way before she starts looking for men on the internet or checking out to see what ex friends are doing. It needs to be a conversation and it doesn't seem to me like, at least in the show, that she gave him the opportunity to talk about those things. Because if he's still questioning, like, were things really that bad between us, then he was not very aware of where she was at. And that's not fair. I think what's interesting about the difference between you and me here is, like, you have a very pro-harmed partner bias. Like, um, you, you, like, you're really pro the victim of the betrayal. And I don't have, I don't think I have that gene. I'm not sure why, but I, I'm really, really interested in the comprehensive story. The one that began, like, two years before... Right. The, the betrayal, you know? So I, I think I remain pro Isa, but you like want her to have done all this work <laughs> that we don't know why it wasn't possible. But I, I appreciate it. I just, I, I'm, I'm actually having to like really go, hmm, do I think that's valid? Of course I think it's valid. It just isn't my starting point. But I still wanted to be with you, not him. 
I just had a moment of weakness. No, no, I don't agree. A moment of weakness. The, there were so many steps. This, I mean, we talk about like the slippery slope, right? Affairs don't just all of a sudden happen. And I don't think we know when she says I had a moment of weakness, that is bull pucky. She did not have just a moment. It wasn't this one decision that she just all of a sudden made one day. There is so much more that led up to this. It kind of depends on how long a moment is, right? A moment could have been a month or two. Mm. Um, That's true. We are recommitted to each other. So like some part of you had to want to blow that up. No, no, I was devastated. This is the part where I remind them, yeah, some part of you did want to blow it up because you were deeply dissatisfied and you did not want to be in the thing that you were in. And so you blew it up. You just chose a pretty bad strategy or I'm actually, it was a pretty great strategy because it did. It did. It, did, it, it yeah. did pivot the relationship. It just didn't um, do it in a way that sustained it. Well, some part of you wanted to get his attention and wanted him to know just how sad you were, how lonely you were, how disengaged you felt from him. I mean, that's oftentimes why affairs are so effective in blowing up the relationship is the rebuild behind it is so magnificent that you create something because of the awareness. Not that I'm telling people to go out and have affairs if you're in roommate syndrome because it's a sure way to shake up the relationship, but you can stay in a good enough relationship for a very long time, but it's very difficult to ignore when your partner comes to you and discloses that they've been having an affair. Nothing I did could snap you out of what you were going through. You, you didn't want to talk. You didn't want to go out. You didn't want to have sex. You didn't, you didn't want me, Lawrence. Watching you get up and go to work was this daily reminder that I had nowhere to go, nothing to do. Why didn't you tell me that? Ding, ding, ding. I was just thinking the same thing. Just couldn't. And then when everything went down with us, it was just easier to blame you. Then I didn't have to deal with my own shit. So here's an interesting part of what he says there is that I, it was just easier to blame you than to deal with my own shit. And that's an important part of, of recovering. And even, even though they're not even together, I still think it's so important to have a postmortem on a relationship that ended and a relationship that ended based on betrayal to figure out what was, what was that I contributed to, which can be such a hard place and a place of resistance for a lot of, what do we call them? The betrayed partner. So Lawrence to the be able to partner, say, yeah the harmed partner yeah is how how did i contribute to all of this what was it that led up that made this relationship vulnerable and how did i contribute it's just a, a big question and, and it seemed like he just wasn't willing to face that in the moment until now after the fact i really wasn't shit but i'm the shit now oh for real yeah i told you i changed you missing out yeah <sighs> What's really cool about this conversation is it, it goes back to something that I talk about quite a bit, which is the difference between repair and resolve. Um, and this is a very reparative conversation and it kind of sets the table for whatever relationship they're gonna have next. They didn't quite resolve the issues that they had before, but at least it gives them a new foundation uh, and, in a, and a place of agreement where they can now build on build on it perhaps and see what see where they're where their friendship goes, where their relationship goes. But I like that they have a really clear, reconnected affinity for one another. And respect, right? They, this was a very respectful conversation. Uh, it's interesting that you say respect because I think that was the piece that was really missing. And also just having a deep amount of contempt. I mean, Issa feeling like she was sort of above Lawrence back when he had lost his job and was trying to rebuild and and that year that he took off where she just felt like you weren't moving you weren't progressing the lack of respect there um, was really lacking and now it seems like they have grown they've changed uh, you know it's we were talking about this Zach of of is it better to sort of take a break grow up individually and see if you can come back together they find that at the base of all of this is this friendship because I can tell that these two have friendship when they smile, they laugh, they joke, and they have this feeling of just respect for one another. One thing that Insecure gets right, especially with these two guys, is the, the very real sort of slippery slope reality of how relationships fall apart. We saw a pretty violent scene 
that marked the end of the relationship, but we're learning that the relationship was ending long before that scene occurred. And I think that's that's a really important takeaway. I think the other thing that it gets right um, is that you can have respectful conversations that are reparative when you show up, when you tell the truth to yourself and to your partner, like that can be really healing. I think the other part that they get right is watching as people grow. So they're in their 20s and we don't have our shit together in in our 20s. And sometimes you have to ask yourself whether or not you are willing to be in a partnership where you allow your your partner to experience their lowest lows. Because I'm guessing that Lawrence would say that was the lowest low um, where there was so much self-doubt. And when you're married, we make this agreement that we're going to be there for one another. But there's also this agreement that you are going to create life together and do life together. And in their relationship, it really seemed like there was nothing happening together. It was more just living side by side, Lawrence in a pit, Isa succeeding, doing well, but not feeling like she can pull him out of the pit. And I think that relationships are just super messy and you have to question whether or not you're willing to be in that mess with the other person or whether you can separate and become better individuals and maybe potentially come back together, which they do.